You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. It's very easy to get caught up on aesthetics and you want to design something really cool that you think, oh, this is amazing. It's, I actually want to share it with everyone, but you've completely missed out the accessible part. And I think as I've matured, I've realized that good design isn't how something looks, but it's how something works. A, a good design is naturally inclusive, right? And an accessibility champion is someone who kind of fosters an environment within their own team where you know we care about accessibility and we're all aware firstly of the different accessibility challenges that we have and why we are designing and developing our products to be accessible. So you know, kind of what is the importance of it? Yeah, yeah, you, you're spot on with that. I think that was definitely a difficult area to implement, diving between the different components, especially when it's all conditional, like you said. I think another one that I think we touched on earlier, though, is the kind of code snippets, which can be another kind of pain area to make sure they're fully accessible. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Your hosts today are myself, Annette Pojar, and my colleague, Laura Vosch. In our daytime jobs, we research and build developer portals at Pronovix. Hi, Laura. Hey, Annette. Hi, Liam. Hi, Jake. You're our guest today from Barclays API Platforms. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. The API portal from Barclays have won uh, the Developer Portal Awards in the Best Accessible Portal category for the second time in 2020. And that is the category that uploads those portals that take the initiative to make their APIs and documentation accessible to all possible users regardless of the disability type or the severity of the impairment. Congratulations. Welcome to the podcast. And while we were talking, you said this is your first podcast. So this is great to have you uh, in an audio medium also <laughs> being accessible <laughs> to people. Yeah, thank um, you. Good to be here. Um, Liam Gallagher, Hi. you are as a UX designer at Barclays API platforms. And as I understood, Jake Eastham, uh, Jake, you are a front-end developer and an accessibility champion. Yeah. The awards that we met you highlighted how you met the challenge of having lots of APIs and a large user base. And we talked a little bit, but that was not much and certainly not about how your personal journey led you to this role. So how did you come into contact with Barclays? Did you already start at the API platforms team? And, and what is your background bringing for you? Um, so yeah, I joined the team about two and a half years ago now. Um, previously held a design director role at an agency and was essentially looking to move in-house. Um, how I came about the API channel was I actually had a friend who worked within Barclays and she had told me how incredibly exciting it was and how how great a workplace it was. And yeah, I I made that jump and moved in house two and a half years ago then. And what about you, Jake? I joined the bank about three and a half years ago. Uh, and I joined the bank in this, into the API channel when I first joined. So I joined on the degree apprenticeship scheme actually at Barclays. So as, as soon as I finished sixth form, uh, I joined Barclays on the degree apprenticeship, which is all technology, um, a digital technology solutions degree. Uh, I'm three and a half years into that now. So my last six months before I graduate. So yeah, I kind of kind of came straight out of sixth form into Barclays and into this role. And similarly to Liam, I, I knew friends who had worked at Barclays and kind of said a lot of great things about it. And it was a really good working environment. So yeah, and they were right. And it's a really nice place to work, I think. <laughs> Liam, your perspective by education is from a graphic designer if I understood correctly, but do you still remember the time when you started seeing with the eyes of software developers as well? Yeah, so I think, go, going way back now, but my grandparents and my, my dad are all engineers. Um, so growing up, I've always been surrounded by the questions of how does that work and why does it work that way and how could that be improved? Yeah, and then formally, education-wise, I studied design. So I'd always been really interested in art and just design. And lit when I was younger, I just wanted to make everything look cool, essentially. Um, and I think it was after graduating university um, where I studied in graphic design um, at degree level, I went on to work for a design house. And it was whilst I was there, going back to how does that work, 
and how can that be improved? I sat with the web design team and it was there that I picked up on how, how you'd build a website and naturally asked a lot of questions, which led me into moving away from your traditional type and print-based design into the more digital aspect of it. So yeah, naturally made that transition, you could say. Um, how did your relationship with APIs as a phenomenon start, if you even remember that? Yeah, um, I think as a lot of developers do, over the time you you spend a lot of time building your own things. Um, of an evening you'd go home and think, how could I build this and how could I make that? Yeah, I, I never got super into APIs early on. It wasn't until I joined the bank that I started to learn how beneficial they are and how they're essentially changing the landscape. And everything is now powered by an API. So I, I can't pinpoint the exact time in space now. But yeah. <laughs> well, I, I asked this because I still distinctly remember when uh, <laughs> my business partner, Christelle, was explaining to me over my first night through coffee, like, what exactly is an API? And I kept looking like every angle of philosophy and like existentialism like what is really an API? I mean, other than the definition itself. And, and it was a bit of a mind bend. To me, I, I come from uh, chemistry, and, and so I do remember that moment when, when it was like, aha, and there's still succession of aha moments of what my understanding is. <laughs> yeah, I, I still have plenty of them. I remember when I first joined the bank, and previously to Barclays, I hadn't had any experience as a developer, but I remember coming, coming into the team and, and kind of being sat down with one of the lead developers at the time and kind of walking through APIs. And I think at the time, kind of using the example of, I think at the time it was Uber that kind of walked through the example of what APIs and the functionality and how we can leverage them. And I think I had the same aha moment as, as you did. <laughs> and um, in the meanwhile, um, so at Pronovix, we also started learning more and more about accessibility. And, and uh, one of our colleagues found something uh, that Barclays is featured on the WAI website as a business case study in a pretty awesome company, uh, Google, Apple and NPR. That's a, uh, wow. <laughs> what context and motivation was there for Barclays to be so consistently devoted to being inclusive? And how do you relate to that as yourselves? Yeah, I think Barclays as an organization have always kind of been really focused on providing accessible services and kind of designing the difference. And that obviously means designing for everyone. I know that one of the commitments Barclays as an organization has made is to be the most inclusive FTSE 100 company. And that's, that's something that kind of Barclays have stated as an aim. I think one of the key kind of changes or requirements for that is changing mindset when it comes to accessibility from, you know, like a reactive approach to, you know, the more uh, proactive approach. So embedding accessibility into kind of, you know, inclusive design from the offset and also kind of sharing the knowledge. I think we mentioned it before as an accessibility champion. We have a community of people within Barclays who are kind of really switched on from the accessibility mindset and really, and really do care. So I think it's fostering a community as well within Barclays that are passionate about creating accessible products. This doesn't sound like just a strategy, but more like some very, very fundamental value, which I guess then there's different aspects, like also from inside uh, the organization, you feel that, right? You were mentioning that it's so great to work there. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot of, you know, I think, my experience is slightly different as an accessibility champion because I've probably interact with people every day and kind of speak about accessibility every day. And I think maybe Liam and the rest of the guys in the team probably feel that too, because I think it's something where as a team, we're kind of pushed a lot and kind of speak to, speak to each other about it. And there's the kind of a lot of different contacts. We have a specific um, accessibility team within Barclays that we kind of regularly speak to really and kind of just have some conversations about things and just, play around with different tools and share different tools and different things that we've learned about accessibility. So I do think, yeah, it's, it is on the forefront. Yeah, I, I think you you hit the nail on the head um, when you said it's it's less of a strategy and it's more of a, a fundamental kind of pillar of the Barclays, what you, what you want to call it, it's ethos, essentially. Everything we, we do is designed to be inclusive and that's from the very outset. So yeah, just just wanted to really clarify it is less of a strategy and it's more it permeates absolutely everything we touch and how we we work as an organization sort of an awareness right yeah yeah 
I have a similar story with uh, nonviolent communication, and I recently realized that it's sort of like taking the, the red pill in the matrix, and there's like no way back once you gain that awareness. Uh, but at the same time, it's a bit of a bitter pill, because once you're aware, you see things that you would have been happier not to see before. <laughs> like, how, how many ways can this go wrong? Yeah, absolutely. It, um, I think it, it kind of, don't want to say it affects your life, not in a negative way, but it... it it's always there. I think you could be out for a meal or you could be scanning a, an app and you're constantly picking up on things that should be, could be improved or little things that just bug you. Jake, you mentioned that you have a dedicated team for accessibility. Uh, can you tell us more about this? Yeah. So yeah, we, are, we have this, um, you know, a dedicated accessibility team within Barclays. I think our first contact with them as, as a kind of API channel was about, I think, maybe two years ago, one and a half, two years ago now. Um, so they kind of audited or conducted like a review of our whole um, Barclays API exchange, um, kind of looking through and going through the WCAG guidelines and picking out all the different things that we were doing wrong <laughs> with accessibility and then bring, bringing awareness to us about what we were doing wrong why, why this is kind of the wrong thing to do who's this going to affect you know um, and ways we can solve this so it was initially our contact with them was you know to help us understand places we were going wrong with accessibility and i think as the time's gone on we probably speak with them less and less these days because we have got the awareness within our own team but they're still there as a as an individual kind of standalone team to help all channels and platforms within barclays to make sure that they're adhering to and actually understand the benefit of accessibility and when you are uh, improving accessibility are you focusing on one separate field or area or are you thinking about more as an organism um i think with accessibility obviously i think as Liam, Liam's the ux designer and i think he has an accessible first design approach where yeah i think he irons out a lot of potential issues and makes my job easier a lot of the time but i think it's not just kind of one one focus that we have in accessibility. I think it's you know a holistic approach that when we're approaching new components or new designs, it's thinking about thinking in kind of the shoes of the of potential users and how they would use this and whether, you know, whether we are designing this with accessibility in mind and different users in mind. So with inclusive design, it sort of rolls out that really everyone gets a better user experience. Was there, however, a side effect benefit that surprised you or something you wouldn't expect? So and initially, um, I don't think there was a side benefit. And that's because, as Jake's just touched on, we design our, essentially, our pattern library to be inclusive from the very start. So we know our products and what we put out into the public domain are accessible and in inclusive from the outset. But I think one of the big things that it has improved is our internal communications. It, it, it's very easy for a, a large corporation or a large company to adopt a kind of silo mentality um, where you'd have one team kind of gets on with their own work and they don't talk to team B and team B don't talk to team C. But um, yeah, with our kind of accessibility team, it, it forces teams to speak with each other and pull each other up on anything that could pose a risk or whatnot. And basically, it just it's really encouraged internal communication. Um, I know that might sound a bit strange, but it's it's massively improved that aspect for us. It gives us an opportunity to then discuss projects that we're working on and moving forward. And then from that, we could see um, new opportunities arise and so on, which we wouldn't have had that communication beforehand if we wasn't discussing accessibility, if that makes sense. It's kind of ironic, right? Like that you're uh, developing and, and iterating on super inclusive but disintegration tools. And that helped you to communicate more with each other, right? As people. Yeah, yeah. So, well, let's hope that's going to be the case everywhere. What does that mean, Jake, when you said that you're an accessibility champion? What kind of unicorn is that? I think it's a term that's been phrased specifically within Barclays, isn't it? Um, I think an accessibility champion is someone who I, I think, first of all, there's obviously we have a community of accessibility champions throughout different channels within Barclays. 
And an accessibility champion is someone who I think firstly kind of fosters an environment of within their own team where you know we care about accessibility and we're all aware firstly of the different accessibility challenges that we have and why we are designing and developing our products um, to be accessible. So, you know, kind of what is the importance of it? I think by creating this community, I think it kind of touches on Liam's last point is when we're all when we're all speaking to each other, I think the job becomes a lot easier when we're kind of sharing different tips and yeah, you know, I think there are some times when kind of more complex components within um, kind of web development, it can be difficult sometimes to get your head around maybe some of the area kind of labeling and stuff like that. So we're having a community of people where we can kind of speak to each other and be like, oh, you know, how, how did you develop that? That looks cool. And we kind of share ideas. I think it kind of fosters a good environment. So yeah, I think the main, yeah, the main thing is kind of the knowledge sharing and just making sure that we have got the accessibility in our forefront of our developing and designing. So that would be when something new is on on the design table still, then people sound their ideas with you or you're involved later, like also in, in rounds of reviews? Yeah, I was asked to be accessibility champion when the initial review was done and essentially a lot of our kind of work wasn't accessible. So the initial job as accessibility champion was to kind of bring through that knowledge um, kind of KT and bring myself up to knowledge with all the information and then doing a review of the platform and bringing it up to these standards. And then I guess within our team, it's kind of setting the, now we have these high standards. It's mm -hmm. making sure we're all aware of the, you know, the different implications and the different changes that we need to keep our eye on. So I think, you know, Liam's obviously well reversed in accessibility and design as well. So I think it's about having a team now where we're, we're all kind of, we all care and we all know the standards that we need to kind of hit. Does it ever come up that some of these standards become contended? For example, um, you're very clear on the Deaf portal about accessibility support, but do you have like specific feedback mechanisms when you get uh, notes like, okay, maybe this isn't working the way you intended, or it's counterproductive, or it's actually not that accessible, and then you have these rounds of contention within the team, like why? Yeah, I think so in terms of like, developing feedback mechanisms i think largely we have like we said we have these internal teams where which we can review components with so that comes as a feedback if we think that you know we're not even something isn't accessible then we have these kind of feedback and reviews with the internal team so not just within our own team we can have the review and the feedback externally within our own team i think generally for new features we use um axe as a browser extension which um, is a really good kind of little tool to use. Um, and that will review new features for accessibility issues against the CAG guidelines. So it's, that's one a tool that we use. Um, and then from that, we also have a, a checklist of sorts or like a traffic light system, which goes through the guidelines and kind of shows how to check whether something has passed a specific guideline. So um, we kind of use that as our feedback. And we, if we develop a new feature, we will go through these two things um, and that often tells us or highlights where we've gone wrong with things and also it'll highlight how we can resolve it. Do you see considerations for accessibility that are developer portal or API documentation specific? Yes, absolutely. Um, w with the dev portal, um, naturally, it's a very code heavy design, essentially. So you're going to have code snippets, right? That the developers want to come along and find, copy, paste and so on. Now, going back to what Jake's just touched upon about having a central design team and having a kind of pattern library of elements and components that have been developed with accessibility in mind and tested and validated, we essentially introduced new components that hadn't been run by focus groups before and were kind of new to the whole Barclays digital estate. And that is the, like I said, the code snippet. So with the platform, we have both a light mode and a dark mode. And initially, when, when you're developing your, your code snippets, it's you've got your standard black background, your white text, and you may have your pink, your sign, your magentas and whatnot. Um, we had to be very cautious that we were developing this the right way and not just doing something that looks aesthetically pleasing and on brand, but something that's also usable and inclusive. And then we also had to do that for... The, the reverse for the dark mode, right? It, it, it sounds like a really small consideration, but again, it's massively important. And we also needed to make sure with those that our screen readers didn't trip up. 
Yeah, going back to what Jake said, we essentially design these components. And then fortunately, when we was in the office, we worked very close to the accessibility team. Mm -hmm. We can quickly throw together our mock-ups or prototypes and we can essentially have a, a side sit session with our accessibility team and they can run through the various tests that Jake touched on. Um, we can put them in front of small focus groups if needs be, and we can just ensure that everything adheres to our guidelines and standards that we speak of. Do you have some tips like how do you go around achieving the same internal working experience with the limitation of not being in the office? Um, yeah, I think, to be honest, we've been very good. Um, we kind of have a, before all of this happened, we did have a, a remote kind of working culture. So you do. we have teams in Pune in India, we have teams in London and dotted all over the world. And we've always been good on that, I think. The tips I'm trying to get at is, is just the communication. I think we've got a very kind of structured process. So if we're designing a new component, for example, we will take the business requirements as well as the user requirements and myself and the team will develop the, the most viable solution that we can imagine. Um, at this point, we're also engaging accessibility to say this is what we are working on. In two weeks, you can expect the prototype. Can you kind of ring fence some, some time to take a look at that? As we're designing something, we've got Jake on board um, a Skype chat away who can give us feedback there and then. We can then get it into a place we're happy with and Jake's happy with, throw that over to the accessibility team who have been made aware of it two weeks prior. They can then test it and ensure everything is, is correct and how it should be. Um, and then they sign off. So um, now back to the question, I think it is just ensuring you're prepared and you're pulling the right teams in at the right times to get the job done essentially in this is your experience and others might be different of course but this sounds like the consistent awareness for at least the regulations and then what extra you can still do you do need the dedicated team for this who are constantly looking with these lenses like it cannot be someone's second or third hand, but you do need a dedicated team. I, I'd say so, yeah. Um, and that's purely within our organization because, mm -hmm. again, we're such a big company. But, yeah, we need people that are always on the cusp and out there running these tests and so on. Yeah, we are very multi-skilled, multi-disciplined within our team. But yeah, having that dedicated team where we can pass something over, it gives Jake time to work on the other components and ensure they're reaching that standard. But um, yeah, it, it absolutely makes sure we are keeping everything inclusive and we're, we're not missing anything. So this being an awareness doesn't mean that it will just happen just because you're aware. You have to be extremely intentional also designing the process of the design process. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think going back to my earlier days, um, it's very easy to get caught up on aesthetics and you want to design something really cool that you think, oh, this is amazing. It's, I just want to share it with everyone, but you've completely missed out the accessible part. And I think as I've matured, I've realized that good design isn't how something looks, but it's how something works. So a, a good design is naturally inclusive, right? Mm. So yeah, absolutely. It is sort of connected, but you mentioned uh, you have like web-based tools to measure accessibility and you do have checklists. I just wonder, do you actually user test or have users to test uh, accessibility? Yeah, so, and this goes back to the accessibility team, but um, they carry out the, um, you could call it qualitative work. So we can run the, the tests on the what we have in front of us there and then, um, kind of your checklist exercises. Um, and then, yeah, we, a lot of it, maybe focus groups. And I, I don't want to discuss too much into their processes because I might not be doing them justice. Um, but yeah, from the conversation we've had and what I've seen from the office is they run practical tests and they use technology and all sorts to ensure everyone is catered for. And that, is then fed back via the accessibility champions. 
So yeah, if, if something's flagged up, then Jake will naturally be made aware and then that will permeate throughout our team. And uh, looping back to the developer portals, do you think there are any standard practices that would actually work against the usability of a code-heavy documentation portal? I I, I can't think. Um, Jake, is there anything? Not not sure, sure about that one. That sounds like there isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were wondering about whether code is just so inherently inclusive and accessible because it's abstraction that it's an it's a no question thing. Or is there something that in the practice of design, of visual design especially, you would say, okay, this is how it's good to do this. But then when you come to presenting a lot of code and a lot of layers of information, then suddenly it's counterintuitive. Did, did you meet anything like that? So I, I I don't want to answer on behalf of you, Jake. Um, but I think one of the things that I would potentially flag is the screen reader and again this is more jake's expertise but yeah if, if you're naturally pasting a huge json object and then your screen reader gets to this um naturally you'd you try to make it as easy as possible for that to be relayed to the user but when it comes to the block of text jake i'm not sure yeah so in, in terms of the screen reader we do i do use nvda screen uh, reader I think in terms of blocks of text, it's usually okay with reading it. I don't know how familiar you guys are with um, you kind of using your screen readers. But in, I think it's quite intuitive normally, but you're right with stuff like code snippets, it can be a real kind of pain area to make sure that the access is working properly and that the screen reads over the complex kind of functionality of the code properly. Again, I think there's a lot of um, kind of documentation support out there on the internet. So I, don't, I never think whilst it's sometimes a sticky area or maybe sometimes it's more hard to make sure that kind of more complex code areas are working accessibility i think there's definitely the support and, and kind of documentation out there do you remember what was the hardest to implement <laughs> um i've got one <laughs> go on so i think um we a ticketing platform to help developers raise requests should they come across any stumbling blocks and um, one of the way it works is you raise a ticket and it'd open a modal essentially a pop-up window and within that there was a lot of different conditional elements so if you was to select x on one stage then y would display yeah you'd hit something and a lot of dynamic content would change and i recall at the time that was quite a tricky one to work with jake i think it causes quite a few headaches yeah for keyword navigation or what i recall is the it was the screen reading um basically this modal would appear and you would say i need help with technical support or i need business support and whichever one you selected the a different form would show um but i think it was the screen reader and tabbing through the content so you you might lose your tab very little things but and i'm not sure if i'm getting too technical with this but our platform is built on React. So again, everything is so dynamic and it's it's figuring out technically, how do we do this? If, it, if that's clear, but yeah, that's one thing I, I recall, Jake. Yeah, yeah, you, you're spot on with that. I think that was definitely a difficult area to implement um, with the tabbing between the different components, especially when it's all um, conditional, like you said. I think another one that I think we touched on earlier though is the kind of code snippets, which can be another kind of pain area to make sure they're fully accessible. What's your favorite problem right now on the dev portal? So we've got quite a big pipeline of work and that is both, I don't want this to sound boring, but we've got our regulatory objectives that we need to hit. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have um, tasks that we want to work on. We want to improve as a, a channel team. One of the big considerations that we're due to start looking at soon is marketplaces. Um, if you've got US developers coming to the platform, how are they going to interact with the site? Because you've got a lot of European-only APIs, mm -hmm. uh, or you could have APIs that are only, um, I don't know, UK-only, or cards that are only for Germany. So how are we going to separate this all out? So it, it is very, very early stages. I just heard it in phone calls, but I'm really interested to see how we're going to work on that. 
and again how how does accessibility come into all of this with not not just an international platform but a kind of global platform so mm -hmm. if we do start introducing your, your different characters and everything how is all that going to work and unfold and that that is that's a huge colossal task that is is going to naturally take loads of plenty of teams plenty of work but um yeah i'm massively excited by that prospect i can imagine sounds like a massive mind-bending thing but a good way yeah absolutely and what's your favorite problem jake lately under that portal what do you want to solve what do i want to solve i think it kind of similar to lean's kind of initial point is that i think on our dev portal, you know, there's a lot of our work is regulatory. And I think there's maybe some projects which we as developers or designers want to kind of fit into that. And it's kind of hard to sometimes navigate between the regulatory releases that we have. So I think some of the stuff like implementing new design languages and using different technology is something that would be really interesting and nice to include and something that we, are, we, you know, we do want to include in further releases. But it's just always hard to navigate between our regulatory projects as well. Mm. Liam and Jake, do you have a message you want to leave the listeners with? Well, firstly, I hope you've actually, you've learned something and I hope you've, you've enjoyed that. Um, but I think it's just always important when we're designing and when we're developing to have the needs of everyone in mind. I think when we kind of have the focus from the outset, I think it makes everything else a lot easier and everything else tends to fall in place. So I think considering accessibility from the outset of any project or design is, is something to take away and something that's really important. I think I'd say mine's probably geared more towards your designers and potentially your, your junior designers, just like I was 10 years ago. And good design isn't something that looks cool and your bells and whistles, but as mentioned earlier, good design is something that includes everybody and everybody can use. There's no boundaries, there's no, there's no friction. So yeah. Good design is, as Jake said, consider everybody from the outset. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix, for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>